Good evening. So there's a couple of folks who've been to my events before. We'll do it one more time. Good evening. Good evening. That's more like it. Thank you for joining me. I'm your council member, uh, Ben Kalos. Uh, for those of you who are social media savvy, I will not be offended if you uh, have your phones and you're uh, using them during the presentations. And we're hoping that you can actually share, take photos, things that are interesting, and share it with folks online. I represent the Upper East Side, East Midtown, East Harlem, and Roosevelt Island. And this is our third <coughs> annual town hall where we bring in city agencies to talk to you about what's important. Outside, we have City Bike as well as Bike New York. And uh, we, tonight, we will have three presentations from the Department of Transportation as well as the Department of Education to talk about universal pre-K. We have the Parks Department, MTA, Capital Construction. They are here to answer the question that many of you have been asking, some of you perhaps as long as a century, which is when will the Second Avenue subway get done? Uh, we also have MTA bus service here. And we will have a very brief presentation about how you can get $30 worth of groceries for $12. Uh, so that's all ahead. I'd like to thank Morris Sloan Hedrick for uh, hosting us each and every year. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, our Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, our State Senator Liz Kruger, our Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, our Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright, her Chief of Staff, and staff are actually outside. They've got a table if you need anything that is a state issue. Also, Councilmember Dan Gorodnik, we share the Upper East Side. Uh, if you're on one side of Lexington or second, you're mine. If you're on the other, you're Dan's. It makes no difference. We're both here to uh, serve. And I'd like to thank all the folks at uh, City Bike and DOT and NYPD for our, their partnership on uh, bike safety. So you don't have to wait till uh, our annual town hall. How many of you heard about our town hall because you got a letter in the mail? Okay, great. And uh, how many of you heard about our town hall because you got an email? Okay, that's the rest of you. So hopefully you shared your email. You'll get a once a month update. It's actually longer than the mailer. And uh, hopefully if you have ideas on how to spend a million dollars, you'll come to one of our events coming up this month. Uh, they were noticed in the mailer. You can also go to our website, to bencables.com slash pb slash propose or you can fill out what you've got in your mailer, but I'm actually going to give away a million dollars. Anyone here in the audience want a million dollars? Okay, so just the seven hands I saw can not do it. But it's for projects like, do you want to improve your park? Does your park need, need a new fountain? Uh, does your street need to get repaved? Uh, do we need to improve your school? Uh, these are the kinds of things that it can do. We need people like you in the audience to be delegates to lead the process. And uh, last year we had about 2,000 people vote in the process. There's actually 140,000 people in the district who could vote. That's my goal. As long as you're in my neighborhood and you live in the neighborhood, you're over 14, you can vote in PV. You don't need to register, and you can even vote online. Uh, so if this is your first event with me, uh, every month, the first Friday of the month, unless it falls on a federal holiday, you can sit down with me between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. You can show up at 8 a.m. You can get out the door by 8.30 and get to work on um, time. You can come in at 9 a.m. Uh, because you feel like sleeping in and come and have a conversation. We usually have about 10, 20, sometimes 50 people just come talk about whatever they want or just learn about what's happening in the neighborhood. If you're a person who has an idea for something that they'd like to do, a policy that they think the city should take on, we have a policy night uh, which, in which you can do some research, work with us uh, to really change how the city operates. Uh, anyone here near 86th Street? Uh, so we actually had somebody come to policy night named Andrew Fine. He said, I want to clean up 86th Street. We worked with him, and now we've gotten twice a day pickup at 86th Street, as well as larger cans, and that's because of his uh, participation. Now, uh, a lot of you should have by now gotten index cards and golf pencils. Uh, if you haven't gotten index cards and golf pencils, if you can raise your hand and folks will... Okay, uh, they were making their way down, and so the format for this is going to be that if you feel that you're going to need a lot of questions, uh, let us know, write them down on index cards, uh, hand them in. So once you fill out your index card and you have your question, hold it up, and uh, you want to get those cards in before the person who is speaking finishes their presentation. The way we've tried to do this, because uh, we have a lot of folks from agencies here, 
is uh, we will have an agency come up. They will give a presentation. During that presentation, if your questions arise, uh, write it down. Uh, raise the card up, and uh, somebody from my office will take that card from you, and then we will collect them. We will group all the similar questions together, and then we will ask them. Uh, if there's anything that you didn't get to, you can actually just email me at my office, or you can write it down, and we can make sure to get that question answered. And you don't even actually have to wait to our annual town hall. Uh, you can actually just uh, email our office any day with any question. We're here to help. Uh, our first uh, speaker tonight is going to be Borough Commissioner, Commissioner Louis Sanchez. He's here for the Department of Transportation. Uh, we work with them to get potholes filled. We, get them, we work with them to get plates fastened. Uh, that's actually one of our specialties. If you live anywhere in the city, somebody's going to put a metal plate down, and that plate is eventually going to get loose and make a da dump da dump. Has anyone ever heard the da dump da dump? outside their windows, so we work very closely with them. Uh, they've told us that our office has the majority of the constituent service in the city of New York, uh, and uh, we hope to keep doing it. We've been working with DOT on um, bike safety, so uh, we've actually expanded the program with Councilmember Dan Garodnik. So now, starting this year, the entire Upper East Side, every single restaurant that does bicycle deliveries will get uh, DOT outreach, they will offer them free equipment, free safety equipment, free lights, bells, and a safety vest. We will then, in exchange, they, in order to get that, they will have to sit through a 90-minute training in English, Spanish, and Chinese. And uh, the pur purpose of those safety vests is so that when you see somebody who is not obeying the rules, going the wrong way, or God forbid, almost hits you, uh, you're able to see the name of the restaurant, you're able to call my office, you're able to call 311, and we're able to dispatch the NYPD to uh, warn them. If you see somebody making a delivery or going into a restaurant without the vest, uh, Mr. Sanchez will, uh, will, will uh, explain uh, that they can come and write a, a strict liability ticket to make sure that they have those on. And uh, we also give away bells and lights in the bike lanes. We are also working with them to give away helmets, all as an opportunity to intervene with the bikes and get them to be safer. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Commissioner Sanchez to uh, come and give a brief five to 10 minute presentation and please start your questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So as the councilman, Said, uh, I'm Louis Sanchez. I'm the borough commissioner for the city DOT. I cover the borough of Manhattan. And just to pick up on some points that uh, he mentioned, let's talk about the plates. One, the DOT does not own the plates. Those plates are owned by contractors doing work for either private building owners, doing work for the city or doing work for other agencies. So certainly call 311, we get the complaints. We'll send an inspector out to see if the complaint, if the plates have been properly fastened. Uh, if not, we will issue a corrective action request. The contractors, depending on the location of the plate, the, the type of movement of the plate, that they have certain time periods to make the correction. If not, they will get a violation notice with the appropriate fine. Uh, in terms of the commercial cyclists, NYPD is responsible for enforcing uh, the laws in terms of bicyclists going the wrong way, riding on the sidewalks. What DOT does is, let's say we get a complaint at a certain restaurant, their uh, riders, their delivery men are, are also violating the, uh, the laws. We don't have the power to actually write tickets to the cyclists, but what we do is we go to the restaurant because the restaurant is supposed to have a roster of their cyclists. They're supposed to have the rules and regulations so that the cyclist is supposed to read and know what the rules are and that's supposed to be posted. If they don't, then we can issue a violation to the restaurant. So those are the two ways that the commercial cycling 
enforcement happens. TV does the actual violation out on the street. We do the violation that inside the restaurant. In terms of projects that we have, DLT projects have done in uh, District 5 over the past, I'll just say this year and you know more recently, uh, we did some signal traffic signal improvements at the intersection of York and 79th Street to make it easier for a crossing. Right now, through our sister agency, the Department of Design and Construction, they've initiated the 86th Street Corridor Project, which extends from 2nd Avenue to Park Avenue. That project has a number of elements. One, the construction of bus bulbs, which are expansion of the sidewalk out where the bus stops are. That will help facilitate the select bus service. Uh, and that, that obviously that helps the buses in terms of you know minimizing some of the double parking or illegal parking that occurs at some of the existing bus stops. In addition, we are doing bulb outs. We're, we're building out the sidewalk at various corners. What that does is it decreases the crossing distance across, uh, on the wide avenues or the cross street uh, so that uh, everyone can cross the street and you know not have to run across the street or they have sufficient time to uh, cross the street. In addition, as you know, I, the Second Avenue subway, I remember hearing about it when I was a kid. <laughs> Rockefeller. Uh, certainly not 100 years ago, but probably uh, close to half of that. And uh, stop, start and stop, start and stop. And I remember seeing it. My parents used to have a grocery store a long time ago at 118th Street and 2nd Avenue. So I do remember when, they, when there was a big uh, discussion about it breaking ground. We've been working with the MTA. The MTA, with all the street with all the uh, construction work that they've been doing, they've obviously torn up the street, torn up sidewalks. We've worked with them on developing a restoration plan, which would enhance the, the uh, streetscape environment along the Second Avenue corridor, which would include obviously new sidewalks, protected bike lanes, planters, trees, uh, and a uh, and certainly benches and some of the amenities that would go along with the new streetscape. So hopefully all that work will at least translate to something positive, something uh, they're looking for the Second Avenue Corridor. I'm sure one of the favorite uh, topics that everyone here in the room uh, likes is bike share. We've done a bike share program. I'm sure everyone here has their bike share membership. We've expanded. We've installed about 25 bike share stations in the district. Uh, right now, the program is expanding up to 110th Street. And you know, we, we've seen the stations. We've uh, we've been able to see they've been getting good usage. We also just completed the installation of crosstown bike lanes. Um, 77th and 71st, 77th and 78th. I'm sorry? There will be questions later. Okay. We're also uh, we're going to have a project that will be coming to the community board later this year, early next year, regarding the Queensboro Bridge. Uh, there's going to be a major upper deck replacement that will happen. So. Once we have, uh, we find, we've advanced the drawings enough, we'll be coming to do a presentation on that to the community board. We've also been working with the Department of Sanitation and the Department of Design and Construction with regard to the Marine Transfer Station at 91st Street, where uh, there's alternate uh, ramp designs being uh, studied for an entrance at 92nd Street. So they, there's a major traffic study that's about to start by their consultants. The OT will be reviewing and evaluating the results of that study to make sure there's a minimal impacts to the community. 
We also, uh, I, I guess, one of the things that I'd also like to um, point out, there were at least three major projects along the FDR Drive that have required uh, some night shutdowns. You know, two of them are hospitals. The other one is the uh, 81st Street Pedestrian Bridge. One of the things that we try to do, if each project needed a shutdown, <coughs> we probably have three times as many shutdowns of the FDR, which means more detour traffic on 2nd Avenue, Lexington Avenue. So one of the things we, we work with the three different projects is that we tell them, okay, these are the days you could, the nights you could shut down the FDR, make sure you all do the work you need to do, take advantage of that shutdown so that we can minimize the number of shutdowns. And that's worked uh, pretty well. So that's, uh, that's pretty much a summary, a quick summary of what I want to say. Certainly I want to be able to have enough time to take questions. Again, uh, any issues, complaints, there's three ways of addressing them. Well, obviously one is contacting uh, the councilman's office, and he will certainly send us an email with the complaint. 311 works uh, just as well. We get the complaints the next day, and then we'll uh, send. You know, we'll do what we need to do to investigate the complaint, and then finally, uh, you can call the office directly. The main number is 212. 839-6210 and the number's on the website on the Department of Transportation website. So by all means we're here to uh, help and address concerns that you may have. Thank you. Come up there with you. Thank you. I just want to thank Commissioner Sanchez because uh, whenever we reach out to him with your complaints we usually get the results. I think I just want to add a couple of key items. If your number one issue is bike enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, I'm inviting you to please go to your precinct community council. Mm -hmm. If you live below 59th Street, your precinct is the 17th precinct. They meet the last Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. at Sutton Place Synagogue. And my ask is this, go and say to the commanding officer, thank you for participating in the bike enforcement program. Please keep up the enforcement and do more, unless you feel that there's proper compliance below 59th Street and above 59th Street up to 96th Street. Your precinct is the 19th precinct. Uh, we have a great commanding officer that we actually brought up from the 17th, and that is the first Monday of every month at 7 p.m. It's at the 19th precinct, which is on 67th Street between Lexington and 3rd. And so just the same thing, if your key item is enforcement, let them know that you're happy that they're starting to do more enforcement as part of our bike safety program, and you're just asking for more. And you can actually cut out the middleman of DOT or my office and just let them know. And again, as you see things happening, please report them. Additionally, just, just, just to add to that, we do get, my office does get phone calls about bike enforcement. We also contact the precinct to advise them. So we would ask you that you uh, cite specific locations so that then you know we can we can send the OT people to just monitor what's going on, and certainly we'll contact the police department to follow up. And uh, two other key items: uh, city bike. Uh, as part of the rollout to the Upper East Side, I reached out to them and said, if you're going to bring city bike here, I want you to make it safe. I want city bike riders to be the safest riders there are. I want you to put your money where your mouth is. If you come to my office, we do it once a month on Thursdays in my office, City Bike will offer all of their riders, anyone who's even just interested, a free 90-minute bike safety class offered by Bike New York, and they get a free month on their existing membership or a free day pass. Uh, whether or not you are a bike rider, a city bike rider, or in favor or against, I urge you to come and see the type of education we are involved in. And last but not least, we do have free reusable bags for you. Please make sure to fill out uh, the evaluation form so we know how we are doing with this event and how I am doing as your council member on your way out. Uh, you're free to leave whenever you want. You're free to come whenever you want. Just make sure to fill out that form so we can get that form. So we've got a lot of different questions. Uh, so the, the first questions relate to uh, the 
reconstruction. Why are there so few, so few new tree beds on east side of 2nd Avenue between 93rd and 91st Street? That's a very good question. We can certainly follow up with the MTA on that. Part of uh, the issues with the street bed, you know, with, with tree planters, et cetera, is the fact that there are underground utilities. So we don't know. Uh, we, DOT, Department of Environment and Protection, they're obviously concerned of tree roots penetrating the ground and being attracted to water and sewer lines thereby causing damage. So part of, part of what happens is it's a function as to their location with respect to utilities, gas lines, etc. But we could certainly reach out to uh, the MTA to see if they you know if there are any other issues associated with that. Okay, so we've gotten a lot of uh, things that have just come in, uh, a lot. So uh, let's just keep on going. Uh, when we talk about the million dollars, how it's going to be. So one question was, what can we do, be done about cars blocking uh, bus lanes? Uh, that is kind of a, uh, a DOT question. So, so certainly, uh, no, obviously cars blocking bus lanes, that's an enforcement question. But we could certainly find out, you know, we can send someone to go out to see what's the reason. Are the regulations, the parking regulations such that we may have to change the signage to allow more turnover in terms of parking? Are there, you know, one of the things you'll see, I'm sure, is truck loading from one of the travel lanes. Again, those, those issues we'll investigate if we have to change the regulations to allow for more loading zones. That's something we'll, that we will uh, certainly address. So, if there's specific locations, by all means, we'll uh, look at it and see what kind of changes uh, we're doing. Right now, the MTA, as part of the Second Avenue subway, they're installing the regulations on our behalf. But at some point in time, once once the project is complete, we'll probably come back and do some minor. Uh, changes as we uh, as the project uh, winds down. At 75th Street and 1st Avenue, the street has holes and have been broken for two years. Uh, so if that person could go to the back of the room and go out and we can take your name and information, we'll work with you on your constituent service request. Uh, Commissioner Sanchez, if we uh, give you the exact location at 75th Street and 1st uh, that have been broken for two years, can you fix it? Hopefully. If it's just Pothole replacement, yes. Sometimes contractors do a lousy job. If there was contractor work and they did a lousy job restoring the street, we can uh, find, we know who the contractor was through our records. We can send them back to redo the work. If it's something else, whether it's a utility that's uh, degrading the street, we will work with the appropriate utility company. So we'll need to investigate first to see how we can address. Commissioner Sanchez, there is form blowing on York Avenue, uh, morning and evening, I'm assuming during rush hours. I actually hear it myself, I live on York Avenue. Uh, it doesn't actually give a specific location. Uh, uh, if the person could just share that with our office by getting a CS4 completed with our intake form. Uh, but what can you do about uh, horn blowing at a specific location like 79th in York, where I know that that tends to happen, probably 74th in York at the FDR entrance. Probably anywhere on York Avenue near the FDR. Well, certainly, certainly, what we look at are signal. You know, is it because of the signals malfunctioning? Sometimes it could be double parking and just congesting the street. We would look to see what may be some of the underlying causes. I, you know, in terms of issuing a citation to the horn blower, that's NYPD, because according to the state traffic laws, you can only toot your horn during an emergency. The problem is, the, 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 prob, the problem is that the officer has to visually see you do it. So that, that becomes a little bit trouble. But certainly, whether it's congestion, you know, I know signals sometimes go off for uh, kilter. We'll get the complaint, we'll go out and try to address that from a traffic point of view. 
misplaced the card, but I remember the question, which was just that, can we get seats at bus stops, at every bus stop? Yes. And I think the uh, quick answer is, if there's a bus stop that doesn't currently have a bench, uh, please just contact my office. We'll work with DOT to get it in there. Uh, an additional thing you can do us to help smooth the process forward is if you find a location where you'd like to add a bench, it moves more smoothly if you can speak to the owner of the building uh, to or the co-op board and get their approval. Uh, but uh, I'll allow the commissioner to address that. Certainly send us the request. Send us the request. Send it to a council member. We do go out and do surveys to see if the, if the requested sites can uh, handle a seat. Again, we have to make sure that we're not uh, going to be interfering with any access manholes or utility structures. So we'll be, you know, we'll certainly go out, send the crew to do surveys, and then work to schedule installation. Uh, what is the upper deck project for the Queensboro Bridge? Well, the Queensboro, uh, as you know, the Queensboro Bridge has two levels, the lower level and the upper level. Uh, that, the upper deck has deteriorated. The concrete deck is deteriorated. It's going to need replacement. It's near its useful life, so that's going to involve deck replacement. Uh, in terms of the, the, sched the actual schedule of work, et cetera, that's something that is still being worked out, but we will be coming back to the community board to present the project and get the feedback in terms of any possible mitigation measures that we would need. Uh, there's a question regarding the interior design building at 61st between 1st and 2nd. Uh, there's, a, uh, no, there's a no standing any time sign and uh, they would like to deal with this because it makes it difficult for deliveries and uh, construction and other items they believe it might be temporary. So if that person, if you, uh, if you actually can write your uh, name and email and phone number on the back of your cards as you're filling them out, for some of them where it's specifically a specific individual issue, we can move that over to constituent service and work with you individually until the problem is resolved. What's the location here? It is uh, 61st between 1st and 2nd. And uh, so uh, is that something where you can look at the no standing anytime sign so that folks can make sure. deliveries? I think that might be related to access to and from the Queensboro Bridge, but we can certainly uh, look at that. Okay, and then I have about uh, 12 different cards on bike lanes. Uh, it's one of the most controversial issues in my district. Uh, one question is about uh, why the bike lanes are dirty. And uh, is there something DOT can do to make sure that the First Avenue bike lane gets cleaned more regularly? That uh, I've actually seen this and it's come up at our policy night. Uh, Danny Cave has brought this up. I don't know if he's here. He's one of the folks who's here frequently. And just FYI, we are recording this. It will be put online so you can share with friends. And just please know that if you're participating, uh, it will be online. So uh, the dirt accumulates on the rumble strips and in the actual pedestrian area. Uh, is there something we can do to get the first avenue and then one second avenue goes in? Well, the bike lanes, the protected bike lanes, they, the width is such that would allow a sanitation sweeper to go down the bike lane and do the street cleaning. So certainly we can follow up with sanitation to see what their regular schedule is and, and work with them to see about increasing uh, sweeping. Okay, I'm going to just, uh, hmm? last one is going to be about, uh, uh, so I think one piece is a question, a couple of questions are about folks going the wrong way on First Avenue and how we're going to uh, fix that one, and uh, what our hopes should be and what we're seeing, and perhaps the OT can back this up, but in locations where you have an uptown, uptown and a downtown protected bike lane, uh, folks actually use it properly right now Riders have a choice between riding with vehicles or riding the wrong way in the protected lane. And uh, for what it's worth in this neighborhood, uh, the in certain neighborhoods in New York City, your most likely cause of death is going to be gun violence. In this neighborhood, your most likely cause of death is going to be by being hit by a car. Uh, so, um, Commissioner Sanchez, do you believe that when we have downtown and uptown protected bike lanes that will limit the number of vehicles 
uh, bikes going the wrong way in that bike lane. And I have one last piece. We that should be that should be happening. Certainly, uh, bikers should not be going the wrong way. Again, we can work with PD. We can also send the OT staff out to monitor and see what we need to do in terms of signage and enforcement. Uh, there are a number of questions about electronic bikes. Mm -hmm. Those are against the law, mm -hmm. period. Uh, we have a program. If any of you live in a co-op, condo, or rental building, we will give you a sign. And what we're asking you to do if you have building service workers uh, is, do you remember when we used to get menus under your doors? Yes. Yeah. But then we started banning people if they put menus under our doors. If we could please empower our building service workers to ban restaurants for up to 30 days if they show up with electric bikes, uh, we can take the bikes if the NYPD sees them riding it. It is a $500 fine. The bikes may actually cost less than $500, so they may just go and buy new ones. But if you live in a building with 100, 200, 300, or 400 units, and all of a sudden that restaurant cannot deliver to your building anymore, uh, then they are going to change their behavior just like they changed the pamphlets. And then I think the other piece is just, uh, hold on, that was a whole bunch of questions about the uh, electric bikes. Uh, and uh, uh, why, why can't we license uh, bicycles? That's the state. Uh, I that's a state legislation, I guess that would be, that would have to go under the vehicle traffic laws. I'm not sure how it handles through the uh, city council, what role they have. I'm sure they probably have to pass the home rule. Sure. Uh, so I'll give a quick answer on that one. Uh, if you've been to our first Fridays or our policy, and I know I'll often tell you the worst thing I can do for you is introduce a law for you or introduce legislation. One of the things we're trying to work on is actually get the laws that are on the books enforced. So uh, right now, every commercial cyclist should have the name of their establishment and a number on their back, and we should be able to identify the problem institutions so that we can dispatch the NYPD there, and we should have NYPD doing the enforcement. That's part of why I'm asking you to go to the 17th and 19th precinct to ask for additional enforcement. But we need to enforce the laws we have on the books before adding even more laws uh, that may not be enforced either. So if we can please thank Commissioner Sanchez. Um, a number of you, Matt, you're, you're good. A number of you asked for uh, multiple, asked multiple questions about multiple agencies. And uh, your questions will be uh, kept for when that agency makes their presentation. Uh, and so the, the question of the, okay, uh, so uh, our method is we're trying to make life a little bit easier for our uh, city employees so that they can show up and go to other meetings first and then come here. So uh, we are waiting on MTA to answer the usual question of when will the second half of subway be done. Uh, when I ran for office, I uh, ran on uh, universal pre-K, I wanted to make sure that every child could get free pre-kindergarten, three-year-olds and four-year-olds. And uh, the good news is that somebody who was also running uh, thought it was a good idea, and he also proposed a similar plan. And when we got elected, we worked together to lobby Albany and advocate, and we won. And we got funding for free universal pre-K for everyone in the city. Uh, one of the most disappointing pieces was in 2014, we only had 124 seats. On the Upper East Side, WNYC identified that there were about 21,000, 2,100 four-year-olds, and so uh, we were we are one of the districts with the fewest number of seats. Uh, ever since then, at every single time I have a chance to see the mayor or Chancellor Green, you know, I've said, "Where are my seats? I need universal pre-K for the Upper East Side." Uh, we were successful in doubling the number of seats at uh, schools on Roosevelt Island. We've been able to open about 100 seats on Roosevelt Island to meet their need. Uh, there are about uh, 10 families left over that we're still trying to figure out how we can help and trying to expand Universal Pre K on Roosevelt Island. On the Upper East Side, we've been able to quintuple that number, and in my district, we're up from 124 up to about 634. And that's been working with the DOE and working with. Uh, individual providers and parents. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, if you have a one, two, three-year-old 
Uh, so if you have a four-year-old right now and you still need a UPK seat, please let us know immediately so we can help you. If you have a one, two, three-year-old or you're planning, let us know uh, so that we can work with you to build a list of parents and gauge need or project need. Uh, I won't rest until we get up to the 2,100 seats that we need in the district. And what we've been able to do is work with parents to identify groups that would send their children to pre-K locations, identifying providers. One of the providers we were able to identify was Roosevelt Island Day Nursery. Another one was uh, Manhattan Schoolhouse. And it takes a partnership of parents saying, I'll send my kids to that private provider, and then pressuring that provider to say, you know what, we're going to take the city as a client instead of individuals as a client. And so we've opened quite a number of seats. There's still more to go. And uh, I'd like to uh, welcome the Department of Education. We have Jeremiah Hay and Daniel Hildreth. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Hildreth. I work for the Department of Education in the Office of Student Enrollment, and I'm here to speak about the work that I oversee, which is gifted and talented admissions uh, for New York City public schools in grades kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, I'm going to walk through sort of a brief overview of the process and how it currently works, and I'm happy to answer questions as after the presentation. So really the process for a family who's interested in gifted and talented placement for their child begins with a request to have their child tested. Um, this happens in the fall before the year that the child is entering school. So um, for current pre-K age children, their families would request testing for them in October. Um, it's a very simple, straightforward way of requesting testing and any child currently in pre-K through second grade is eligible to be tested. Um, the only requirement really is that they reside within New York City. This year the deadline to request testing is November 14th, so really this asks families to kind of get in touch with us early on in the school year. If a family misses the deadline, we try to work with them to the extent possible. Um, they should reach out to us if they've missed the deadline and are still interested in having their child tested. And RFTs, which is how we refer to the request for testing, can be submitted a couple different ways. Um, one, they can be submitted online. It's by far the easiest way to submit a request for testing. Um, but they can be submitted in person at any of our family welcome centers or at a child's current Department of Education public school. Um, once a child is tested, the actual testing occurs in January of the new year. So, again, families are requesting testing this fall. They'll actually be tested in January. And then families will receive their score reports in the spring. So, those tests are sent off and scored by our testing vendor. And families receive their scores. Um, typically, this happens in early April. And if they submitted the RFT in person, they'll get those score reports mailed, but if they submitted it online, they'll get it in their email and mail at the same time, which is what we encourage families to do. Um, just kind of keeps everything nice and neat. Once you get that score, you have a couple of options that are laid out in front of you depending on your child's score. So um, any student who scores an overall score of 97 and above is eligible to apply to two types of gifted and talented programs in New York City. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through what those two types are. So one type are district gifted and talented programs. These are programs that are situated within larger neighborhood community schools. So um, you can envision a school that has a catchment area or a zone that serves families in the area, and they may have a classroom or two reserved for the gifted and talented program. Um, there are about 100 of these across New York City. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about the ones that are in um, Councilman's district here. Citywide gifted and talented programs are um, programs that are of which there are only five of them across the city, and they take students who score at a 97 or above. So they have a higher cutoff score 
And these are schools that do not have a zone. Okay, so these are schools that serve students citywide, and the only way to be admitted to these schools is through taking and receiving an eligible score through the test I'm speaking about. Um, so those district programs, anyone uh, who scores a 90 or above is able to apply to those. And again, the citywides um, really are only considering students who score a 97 and above. So that's, that's the principal difference there. Um, again, we ask that families are New York City residents from beginning to end of the process. So they're living in New York City when they're requesting testing, when their child is tested, and when their child enters school the following fall. So those families who have a child who received an eligible score will receive their score report explaining um, the metrics of how their child scored on the test as well as if an eligible score, they'll get an application. Um, families can apply online. They can also apply at any of our family welcome centers. And this is where they would list all the programs that they're interested in um, on that single application. Again, um, in person or at any of our field offices. Our family welcome centers are located um, throughout the city and those are offices that we have there are satellites of our main central office where families can go for more information if they have questions or would like to receive in-person um, interpreted services. So on the application, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to list the schools that you're interested in, as well as um, whether the child has a sibling at any of those schools to give them a priority to be admitted to those schools. Um, we ask families to try and visit the schools whenever possible that they're applying to, um, to get a sense of the school environment, whether this is a school they'd honestly consider for their child, but also to test the commute to the school site. Um, this may seem like a logical point to make here, but we really ask that families only apply to schools that they're actually genuinely interested in sending their children to. Um, and what this does is it really just encourages people to be realistic about what they want um, so that others can get what they want and um, ultimately if they get an offer to a school that they're not um, surprised when that happens. So there are a couple priorities for uh, how a family may receive an offer to a school through this process. Um, one is whether the child has a older or younger sibling already at the school in the elementary grades, kindergarten through fifth grade. So if a um, family has a, another child at the school, we would prioritize that child for admission. Obviously their score comes into play, so we, um, amongst siblings and non-siblings, we are placing students who have a higher score first. And we give priority to families who reside within the district for district programs. So um, if you reside within District 2, which the Councilman's District encompasses, um, you would get a priority to attend those schools within the district over a child who resides in another district. Um, we have a couple of strict rules about grade placement. So students born in 2012, so we are current pre-K students, are eligible for a kindergarten placement in the fall of 2017-18, so a year from now. They would be entering kindergartners, and students born in 2011 would be eligible for first grade placement. Um, grades two and three, we have a little more flexibility. Sometimes um, students have completed different grades in other states and cities, um, or have had some situation where they've been promoted or held back. So we really look to the child's previous schooling um, to determine the grade placement for them. Um, I'm going to kind of go through these criteria a little bit quickly, um, but essentially, like I said, we give priority for siblings and then by score. We encourage all families to submit to our process and really request testing and um, English language learners, students with disabilities, um, we feel that they have a right to participate in these programs and should do so. Um, and those schools that they will ultimately be placed at are required to provide those services. Um, a couple things. No guarantee of getting an offer. There is a higher demand than there are available seats. 
And even scoring at that highest score does not guarantee an offer. Um, all families should also apply to kindergarten for the fall uh, outside of the gifted and talented process to make sure they have a school for next fall. And just a note about transportation. Um, transportation for GMT programs is the same as any other school or any other program. Uh, it has to do with the child's home, address, and the commute and distance to the school. And I just want to highlight the programs that are within Councilman's District. Um, we have PS77, Lower Lab, and PS198, which share a building. Um, they have two classes and one class on each grade level, uh, respectively. And then we have PSIS217 on Roosevelt Island. They also have a gifted and talented class uh, on each grade level. Just want to put our contact info up here. Um, feel free to reach out if you have questions. I'm happy to answer them at any point during the school year. And um, happy to answer any questions now if there are any from the crowd. I appreciate it. Afterwards. OK, great. So um, thanks for having me. Thank you, council member. And I'm Jeremiah Hay. I work with the uh, pre-K for all initiative at the DOE. Uh, you might know it better as UPK. I feel as though the council member really spoke to the work that you've done and that we've been able to do in this district over the last two years. Uh, we've over quadrupled the, the number of free full day high quality seats in this district and something we're very proud of. Uh, but we know that our job isn't done. Uh, we are proud of the progress we've been able to make. Uh, we will continue to work with the council member and his staff who have really been tireless advocates on this issue uh, to do everything we can for this district and for every other district in New York City. I uh, just want to say very briefly, uh, the one thing that the councilman didn't cover was um, why I'm here. Um, Pre-K is a good, uh, the numbers, you can read numbers two ways on almost anything. Uh, I think we all know that, but you can't really read the numbers two ways on pre-K. It's not going to get it good for these children, and we've been able to turn around and turn it into a public good over the last couple of years. Um, the councilman has been a big part of that, um, and, and please do know that admissions are still going on. Uh, if there are families that you know of in this district or out of this district that are still looking for a seat, please let him know or let me know after the presentation. That's what I do. Uh, the team that I'm on is called the Pre-K Outreach Team. It's a dedicated team of 35 to 40 people. It's our job to help parents one-on-one -on -one find a program that works for them, uh, work around their commute, work around their schedule, what they need for after school. That's what we do. Um, so please find me and let me know if you or a family that you know um, is still looking for placement. And then also, please just keep in mind what Daniel said about the GNT schedule uh, for current Pre-K children, if you know any uh, who are in a program or not. Uh, that's going to start for them in October. Uh, that's what I have. If you do have any questions about the program as a whole, or if you're a family looking for a placement or you know one, uh, please do let me know afterwards. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, one thing I just want to please hold your cards up if you have questions for DOE. And I think one thing I do want to stress, uh, there are at every, as far as I know, if you want to come up and I'll just ask you a quick question. Sure. Uh, has, has every four-year-old on the Upper East Side of Council District 5 that has applied for UPKC been offered a pre -KC? Every family that applied during the original application period, we call that round one, has been offered a pre -KC. Right. Uh, we are still working with someone to find a program that's going to work the best for them. Um, I'm happy to do that work at least if you are a family with that uh, descriptor or you know one that says. And, and I think just one piece to be clear about is uh, that's where we're doing the work, which is there are pre k seats all over the city and folks are able to find them sometimes more closer to their work. Uh, but what we're trying to do is make sure we have the seats here in the neighborhood, which is why we're trying to get 2,100 seats right here. So that's some of the work we're doing. Uh, and if we have any of the cards that have been filled out, we can bring them down. Uh, I should also mention, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, we were happy to add four new pre-K programs this summer on the Upper East Side, two in this district. Uh, one is PS6 and the other one is PS83, which you might want to buy. Uh, it's right next to this building. PS183, yep. And so we've got uh, two questions. OK. 
Okay, I have a question for Hunter. Uh, Hunter on UPK, so let's start with UPK. Some UPA programs are tied in with Head Start, in which some families make more than the uh, poverty guidelines. What can be done? Uh, so that is true. Uh, there are pre-K programs in New York City that are tied uh, to the income of the family. Uh, most seats are not like that. Most seats on the Upper East Side are not like that, but there are a couple programs up here that match that description. Uh, those programs have a special mission to serve families that fit their criteria. Uh, we, are, of course, are working to make sure that every family of every income level has a seat that they think is the right one for them. Okay, and then a question about uh, what I assume is uh, Hunter College High School, uh, which is, are you able to improve the instruction at Hunter? Clocks don't work, auditorium are not clean, elevators have problems, etc., etc. Uh, and so Hunter's out of my district, but we can also, uh, after uh, they get the talented uh, person uh, answers the question to the best of his ability, if you let us know, we'll actually pass this information on to Council Member Dan Rodney. And we can work with you to the extent that you're my constituent, but your child is in a school in his district. We can work in partnership to see what kinds of things we can improve. Uh, and you can feel free to work with your school to engage in uh, advocacy for funding to improve the auditorium and other pieces. In my district, if there's a school that needs an auditorium, try to get it on the PV ballot, and then get everyone you know to vote for it. Questions about Hunter? Yeah, I guess, unfortunately, this is a little bit outside of the work that I oversee. Um, I really just work with kindergarten through fifth grade gifted and talented programs. Um, however, if we receive a request, we're happy to hook you up with the resources and the contacts um, that maybe can address this concern, but I'm sorry that I'm not going to be that person this evening. Uh, so uh, please just step out, and one of our uh, staff members or interns will work with you to take the information down. We'll begin work on that. So uh, we're actually running ahead of schedule. We're waiting on two speakers to come by. Marcus Book from MTA as well as MTA Capital Construction. Uh, so uh, our next speaker is probably scheduled to start in about 10-15 uh, minutes or if they arrive a little bit earlier. So if folks want to get up, stretch their legs, step out, you're welcome to. In the meantime, I'll just give a quick, quick update on uh, what we've been up to in our office. We have one more question for DOE, and uh, then we will let them go. Uh, so this is a broader DOE question, which we'll take to DOE, uh, which is, is there a program to fix all clocks in the public schools that should be? So if you're able to, uh, again, step out in terms of the uh, intake form and let us know uh, the specific schools you're speaking about. Uh, one of the problems is if you go to the doctor and say, doctor, it hurts. And the, the doctor says, uh, where does it hurt? And the doctor says, it hurts whenever I put my finger here, here, or here. It's like, well, that's because your finger's broken. Uh, if you're able to give us a little bit of uh, specific locations, we can work with you on that. Uh, so if you're stepping out, please make sure to come back in by 7.15, and we will have a presentation from the Department of Parks. So in terms of some of the work that we've been doing in the office, I'll just share a little bit of what's been in our most recent newsletter. There's something called a tenant blacklist. Does anyone here know what that is? So I see uh, one or two hands, three, four. So if you ever have a dispute with your landlord and you need to go to the court, you're now on the tenant blacklist. Whether or not you were in the right or the wrong, whether you won or lost, and uh, this is something that I've been working on since I was the Chief of Staff for Selma and Jonathan Bing. He introduced legislation on this. Senator Kruger actually tried to get rid of the blacklist by stopping the courts from selling the information to credit reporting companies, and then they started just paying people to sit there and take notes. So I've introduced an initial bill that says it should be a human right to go to court without facing discrimination. Uh, and so uh, that's in our Civil Rights Committee. Uh, that's very similar to what some of them Jonathan Zing had introduced. And the other piece which we work with Senator Liz Berger's office on is requiring tenant screening companies to be licensed so that they would have the same uh, items that uh, the uh, credit reporting companies for your credit cards have to do. So they have to actually tell everything back like it was. Uh, another piece that we've seen is uh, uh, there's a lot of patronage and corruption in government. Anyone been reading about that in the newspaper recently? <laughs> and so, as it happens, the Department of Investigations found that one of the ways you can tell when corruption is about to rear its ugly head is when somebody gets hired without a public posting. 
you see it makes it a lot harder to do that if you require people to advertise. And in fact, every time we have an opening in my office, we actually advertise. We usually get about 1,500 applicants for uh, every position. Uh, one of the things that we do is we have a great internship program, and most of my staff started as interns. Uh, Isabel, who's in the back of the room, actually helped put this event together, started with us as an intern. Uh, we, she interned for us while she was at Scripps College. Uh, she was invited back as a fellow. We gave her a uh, waiver for her Metro card and asked her to come back. And uh, when she had to compete against uh, the 1,500 other folks, it turned out that she knew all the right answers because she had worked with us. Uh, <laughs> so that being said, we still believe in an open process. So I've introduced legislation that would require there to be a uh, uh, two weeks of advertisements before any job is interviewed. Uh, we actually just signed into law a, another law. Uh, this one deals with uh, resiliency. Anyone live up in the 90s? Uh, so if you're in the 90s, you know that we flooded during Sandy. And so we have a city 2020 plan for uh, how we're going to prepare for global warming and uh, the uh, waters rising. And uh, what uh, we did is we passed the law that there would be a new advisory board. It has a whole slate of new members. If you're interested in our waterfronts or you know someone who is and would like to serve on the advisory board and planning for resiliency of our city, please let us know. On uh, the 29th on Roosevelt Island, we'll be giving away go bags. Uh, so who here knows what a go bag is? More folks, which is good. And how many of you have one? Good. Did you get it from our office? Yeah. No. Okay. So uh, if you already have one, this may not necessarily be for you, but we're giving away go bags. Uh, they come with a lot of the things that you need, but you're going to need to add more stuff. You can come to the meeting. There are a nice sturdy backpack with some emergency supplies, and uh, that will be on uh, the 29th at 6.30 p.m. at Good Shepherd Community Center. And if you're interested in joining a community emergency response team, uh, you can also uh, do that. Uh, I think that's about it, so I'm just going to recess for about 10 minutes if you don't mind. And if you have specific constituent service requests or one of your questions did not get answered at one of the previous panels, uh, if you want to step outside, we'll be at the table and working with you. And I apologize for this uh, delay. We had hoped to have folks back to back. And one of the things we've been trying to do with our agencies so that they don't have to do it is, uh, how many here have been to a forum before, a government forum by any chance? So typically what you see is the, the commissioners and all the people have to stand, sit at a table from start to finish from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. And that takes up a lot of their time and trying to respect their time. We've asked them to show up for specific slots. So for MTA Capital Construction, we asked them to be here from 6.20 to 6.40 so that they could go and so on and so forth. So we're waiting on MTA Capital Construction and MTA Plus. And uh, we are expecting the uh, New York City parks in about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you and enjoy. Please meet your neighbor.
good to see everyone here. Uh, I was here last year and enjoyed my, uh, my stay, and I wanted to give you a brief update on some of the things that are going on around your district. Um, first of all, uh, the council district map, there we go. Uh, that gives you a sense of some of the parks you have here in your district. Um, most of the parks are along the perimeter of the district, um, owing to the uh, development of, of the side uh, for uh, housing. So whether it's uh, Asphalt Green at the north, Carl Scherz Park, uh, Sam Seabury Playground in the northwest, uh, the East River Esplanade, which you'll hear soon about the progress there from my colleague uh, Eric Lanzalata, who's to my right, um, St. Catherine's Park, 24 Sycamores, and in fact, um, a new park, which we're very pleased to talk about uh, in one minute. Um, additionally, um, 90th Street Pier uh, is something that uh, we're very pleased to say that uh, uh, this summer we worked with the, uh, as the uh, councilman was saying about the conservancies, the Friends of the East River Esplanade, uh, opening it up to the public on Sundays uh, this summer. The pier, <coughs> excuse me, has now been transferred from the Department of Transportation to the Parks Department. Uh, so it's now Parks Department property. And we're thinking about um, uh, how to make it more accessible to the public. And we'll be talking about that uh, very soon. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about was the Andrew Haswell Green Park um, at the southern part of the, uh, of the district. Work is underway on the roof of what uh, many of us remember as the old heliport building. Um, under the roundabout sculpture, that big uh, metal sculpture that we all see. Uh, we are constructing a sitting area and lawn, lawn excuse me, that will provide really terrific viewing of the, of the river for people who want to sit there and relax. Um, it's really quite something that the project costs three and a half million dollars um, and it's a combination of funding from the city council and state grants for our president. We expect to complete this early next year. So you see some of the work that's being done there. You really can't see very much uh, on it, but uh, they're working away. And this is really going to add additional park space that really can be used uh, for the public um, and uh, something that we're very excited about. But that's not all. There's a phase 2B, uh, appropriately named. Um, this is the area uh, where it is right now. Um, and it's pretty rough. And underneath it are a number of uh, pilings that are really at the end of their useful life. Um, so we are uh, going to be reconstructing this part of the Esplanade uh, to the north of the Heliport building. And we are going to construct something that's quite beautiful, a sloping lawn um, with plantings, um, a, a, sort of a grand staircase, uh, so you can make your entrance when you come into the park, um, if you so desire. Uh, the big part of the project, which will cost $25.6 million, is to uh, replace the pilings underneath. And it's an expensive job, a lot of work, but very much needed. And we're very pleased that the funds came from the proceeds of the sale, <coughs> excuse me, of the city property at East 74th Street uh, to Mor Memorial Sloan County Hospital. So uh, a lot of it is, is uh, private funds, which we're very pleased. And this will be handled, uh, the construction by the um, Economic Development Corporation. Now that new park that I was referring to earlier um, is going to, and here's, here's an evening uh, view of it. Um, the new park is something that's been talked about uh, for a number of years, as those in the know know. Uh, we'll, <coughs> we'll be building a new park behind one Sutton Place South, the private apartment building in uh, Sutton Place. And it's connecting current street end parks of 56th and 57th Street, to the east and the west as you look at it, uh, north and south as it actually is. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's really going to feature a beautiful walkway um, above the river, uh, wonderful seating, a beautiful lawn uh, where people <coughs> can really have uh, a really nice, nice expanded ability to sit and relax. Um, I don't live too far from this area. Uh, my wife and I are certainly going to enjoy it, as I'm sure many New Yorkers will. Um, we are currently in the process of, <coughs> excuse me, of awarding the contract and expect to begin construction by the end of November. So that's very good news. Uh, it's a two million dollar project. It was funded uh, equally by the city council and the co-op at Sutton Place South. Uh, nearby, uh, not too far away, uh, 24 Sycamores 
24 Sycamore. Your PC will shut down in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you press cancel. No, it'll be uh, 60 minutes. No, it was postponed 60 minutes. Mr. Phelps? Yes. You got it? You want to postpone it? Self destructing. <laughs> I still love that show. <laughs> I always did all these wild things. It's great. Um, Barbara Bain was the, the brainy, beautiful uh, agent, right? She was great. And Martin Landau. Uh, all right, Sutton Place Park. So here's what it's going to look like. I always wonder how they get all these people there, uh, <laughs> figure out how to uh, get them to pose for this. Um, but it's, it's really going to be great. And uh, those of you who've gone there into the small parks, you know how beautiful it is. And this is just going to be much bigger and even more beautiful. And I think it's going to be really <coughs> a very special classic park of our community and of the city. It's really something to look forward to. Uh, so we're very pleased about that. And then Councilman, that sort of helps make the east side a little bit more like some of those great west side uh, river uh, parks. So I think we're, we're adding on to it. Um, <laughs> a little more prosaic, but very important. The 24 Sycamores Playground, um, just uh, to the south of it, um, no, excuse me, to the north of it, uh, we're going to refurbish this uh, bathroom in 24 Sycamores Playground, and it's going to be uh, ADA accessible, really some uh, beautiful pavements and um, uh, fittings. It's going to make it state of the art, something that's really nice. You know, some of the, the comfort stations, as we call it, get kind of old looking from the Robert Moses era of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So we're upgrading this and making it something very, very nice. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Some of you know about there's a, a discussion going on, <coughs> excuse me, um, about the uh, uh, Queensboro Oval tennis bubble. Uh, there was a discussion um, about this from the community board last week. I won't go into it except to say that uh, there's a divergence of opinion as they would say in the State Department. And uh, we're working with the elected officials, especially the councilmen, uh, to go through this. And I'm confident that over the next uh, few weeks, we'll figure out a, a way to go forward that makes sense. Um, I'd like to um, uh, have Eric Linslana now come up and briefly talk about the progress that's being made along the East River Esplanade. Councilman Kalis has been a terrific champion of this uh, part of the district. Very important part. Um, it's going to make a tremendous difference in um, the, the beauty and, and uh, relaxation uh, in our park system here on the east side. And right now we're doing, in the last few years, repairs. And Eric's going to talk uh, a little bit more uh, with the, the depth that he has about it. So, Eric. Thank you. just the park on top we're dealing with, it's a, a structure underneath that's very old and in most cases at the end of its design life, which makes the whole thing very expensive and very complicated because most of it is underwater. Um, so what we've done, uh, just to catch people up if you're not aware, we commissioned a series of studies where we uh, had divers go under, we used ground penetrating radar, a lot of other um, interesting investigative technologies, found out where the worst segments were and the idea is that the $35 million is great. It doesn't do everything, so we are targeting the improvements in the sections that need it the most. Those are the places that are uh, the most deteriorated and likely to collapse. Where sinkholes are, those are great indications of where there's big problems underneath. So the sinkhole looks really easy to fix, but it's what's underneath that's very difficult to fix. It's very expensive. Um, what I wanted to show, the, the first site we've actually finished design for uh, is um, starting at the, uh, the ramp here and goes up to um, 81st Street. And unfortunately, we had hoped that the DDC would be finished with the bridge project at 81st Street right now. Um, they're not going to be done, I think, until this winter. Uh, our site is completely designed, and what we're going to do is uh, the landscaping and the, the seawall work in front. Um, so what we were able to do, in addition to the structural work, is basically do a, a landscaping redesign 
control out of this area. Um, and we're going to fit a uh, fixed uh, feature, curved paths, renewed plantings with uh, an eye to species that are more tolerant of the conditions on the esplanade. So instead of your normal street trees, we're talking about trees that can survive the salty environment, the intense sunshine in the summer, uh, lack of regular water that we, that we have there. So hopefully we'll get a more permanent green out there for you. Um, our basic idea here is to separate uh, bike path is where we have enough room and uh, to have a separate seating area so you're not <coughs> colliding with people if you're trying to bike or jog through and you're not uh, getting interrupted of your enjoyment of the scenery if you want to sit on the bench. And uh, where we have a little bit less room, um, we're going to, to make do with what we have. As you know, there's a lot of pinch points there, so we're working with what we have. Uh, Carl Schurz Park is a little bit different than the rest of the Esplanade in that it's a very tall uh, retaining wall that's, that's over the water, and uh, we're going to be fixing the north end of that. If any of you are familiar, there's a lot of problems um, with the wall there and that it's collapsing. Uh, we're going to be tying that back to the, basically tying it back and stabilizing it in place. And then it's also going to give us the opportunity to, to do a little bit of uh, landscaping work to restore the amenities, new benches, railings, um, fix things where appropriate, replace them when necessary and hopefully make the whole thing function a little bit better. Uh, that's also going to be in phase one. In phase two, uh, which is going to happen in two years, uh, the area a little bit north of there, at 90th and 91st Street, where there are uh, there's raised planters coming up uh, out of the Esplanade. Uh, investigations are ongoing there right now. Many of you might have seen a sinkhole at 90th Street that's now being excavated as of yesterday. And uh, part of this excavation is where we're basically using this opportunity to probe in there and find out what the limits of the damage are so we can make a more economical repair. Uh, as I mentioned, Carl Scherz is phase one, and that's going to be in construction next year. Uh, this is showing um, the area in the north of Carl Scherz and this section line AA. This is what it's going to look like. So like we're doing a little bit south, we're going to have a, a bench towards the railing. We're going to use the area that's a little bit to the west as a shared uh, biking and uh, running path. So to kind of separate the active and passive uses where we have room to do it. Now the area north of there uh, is part of, it's a phase one on the left and phase two on the right of this image, right near that 90th Street Pier. Uh, we're also going to get to, to redesign parts of this, like I mentioned. I'm just going to breeze through a lot of this. We really hope to put in a tidal pool um, here. I don't think we're going to be able to do it, so unfortunately this slide is a little bit old. What we wanted to do is have, uh, have water come up over the, the seawall when, when it's high tide and then stay there and you can see kind of marine life growing. I don't think we're going to be able to squeeze this into the design, but it's on our list for, for maybe in the future. Um, our top, my top priority for phase one, uh, this is in final design right now, is the huge sinkhole up at 114th Street, which is a little bit out of your district, but it's all part of the same project. Um, basically, we're going to re reconstruct the esplanade up there, uh, fix the, the gap that's there. And, finish it up. and just some random things really quick. Okay, go ahead and show these. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we want to do here is uh, build off of the, the work that's happening uh, a little bit sooner um, in the 70s, and that's to, to build up a wall towards the FDR to block some of the noise. And uh, hopefully in the future, these are some renderings from our landscape architects, hopefully in the future this can serve as a mounting for flood barrier if that's necessary, and if nothing else, a noise barrier to kind of help you out with the, the noise from the FDR. That's just a sketch. So if you have a question cards that you haven't already passed up, please raise your hand. Uh, we already have about five to ten. The commissioner is going to group the ones that are similar and answer your questions. All right, thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to do the Karnak imitation first. <laughs> Dry ice pellets. Question. St. Catherine's Park. What are you going to do about mice and rats? Okay, so we've discovered a, uh, uh, with the help of the health department, a way to 
eradicate uh, rats uh, in our parks without having to use uh, bait. And um, <clears throat> so uh, the benefit of this is what, what is done is basically we put dry ice pellets uh, in the burrows and then just close up the burrow and it as asphyxiates the rats, which is not something pleasant to think about, but scientists say it's the most humane way to do it. Um, and it does it very quickly. <coughs> and the benefit of this, uh, in addition to getting rid of the rats very quickly, you don't have to use bait um, and so that uh, if there are hawks in the area, there aren't any that I know of in this immediate area of St. Catharines, uh, they won't ingest by killing the rats and ingest it. But even better for it, in a sense, or a different benefit is that we don't need a trained exterminator to do this with a license and using pesticides and that kind of thing. We can train any of our park workers in the right title to do this. So we can expand our ability to do this. I don't have to wait for the, the two exterminators in the borough to find time to get there. We can do this more, much more quickly. And uh, we've had a lot of experience with this. Health department is very, very helpful. So this is something we're going to be expanding. And so we'll be able to address that. The other thing is to make sure we pick up the garbage uh, promptly. Um, and sometimes there's garbage uh, in other areas. We have a lot of food establishments around St. Catherine's that you know. So uh, they get into the bags uh, and then they can burrow into the park. So that's something that we work with the health department. But anyway, so we have good news on that for you. What can be done to improve Karlsher's restrooms, gazebo, and esplanade? But you, you heard a little bit about the esplanade. Um, bathrooms are <clears throat> from uh, many decades ago. Um, we will work to uh, do some improvements there. Uh, we're trying to make improvements throughout the system in the, in the bathrooms. Um, you can do a capital renovation, which is very expensive. Um, if we have the funds and it's appropriate, we will do that. But other than that, we can make some other kinds of improvements. I'll go up and take a look at it next week uh, to take a close look with my chief operations, and we'll report back to the councilman on what, we're, what we think we can do there. Um, McCarnick again. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> is Peter Detmold Park still there at 49th Street? Yes, it is. It's not in Community 40, but it is there. It's a wonderful park. Um, and you, you get there on this sort of interesting uh, way down the staircase. I encourage you all to check it out. Take a walk around the district, or you can go a bit south. There's some interest, especially, we're very lucky in Eastside. There's, there's a lot of interesting little uh, parks and beautifully designed. Carl Schur is one of the most beautifully designed parks in, in the world, actually, and there are other little places, so uh, we, we're very lucky in that regard. Um, <clears throat> there was one concern about the new park, Sutton Place Park, and um, uh, there was a big exclamation point here. Is, uh, I think the person who wrote this is, uh, is kind of concerned, I should say. Um, what are you going to do to keep the plants and the lawns from uh, not drying out? <laughs> Uh, there's going to be irrigation at Sutton Place Park. Uh, that's going to be great. And we'll be able to uh, irrigate uh, the lawns and the plantings on a daily basis. So that's a real advantage. So it was a good question. Uh, trees disappearing, <coughs> excuse me, due to high-rise construction. Uh, yes, you know, we all know how much construction is going on in the city, right? It's aggravating in a way, no question. Uh, part of it is, um, uh, when they bring in the cranes to do in the, bring in the steel, um, trees sometimes, uh, despite our best efforts, have to come out, but then they're required to do um, a, uh, a very extensive tree uh, restitution and planting. So while you, and occasionally there's a tree that will not be able to be replaced because there's a utility uh, vault or something like that, but we'll be able to repopulate the area where we can have trees. A, a lot of them are already planted, so we have to it's not easy to find them. Um, but that's, that's often the case. If you have a concern about this, you can call 311 or call my office at 212-408-0201. Our forestry people are very much involved. This is a big part of their job is to deal with construction. And they, we just don't let them cavalierly come in and just cut things down. They have to submit very detailed plans to the city, to us. And we go and we meet with them and we figure these things out. Um, and there is restitution that is required. If they, if they plant a new tree, can we get free tree guards? Uh, Are those covered? This is good. The councilman always asks me questions like this <laughs> that go and push it to see what else we can do for the community. And well, this is a good topic. All right, so we'll, we'll see about that. Um, that's a very good point. What was the question? About whether we can get, in addition to the trees being planted, protective tree guards 
paid for by the developers. Or, or, or from the money we set aside for them. Okay. Bicycles. Uh, no, no, those aren't for you. Oh, that's for John Jay. Oh, John Jay, good. I don't want to answer that one anyway. Uh, okay, John Jay Park. Uh, the lady shower has only three hooks left out of six. Uh, I wouldn't know that ordinarily. Uh, but when I'm going up to Carl Schurz to check out the bathrooms, then I'll make a detour down to John Jay. Um, uh, I'm sure we can uh, uh, address that. Well, we'll, we'll, I'll inquire about it actually this evening. I'm sure we can address that. You're right. John Jay had a lot invested in there to make it better, and we're working with the councilman to do even more in the future. Um, so, at the 79th Street neighborhood association. Yes. And, hang on. And one of my favorite people, Betty Cooper Wallerstein, um, I, I want to thank her for her efforts for John Jay Park. And uh, we're very appreciative of it. And uh, where are you at? I actually, there you are. I was actually saying that to you. That I know you were. Clever but I'm saying it to around. you. I <laughs> wanted to thank you very much for the support given the Neighborhood Association and the East 81st Street group that's working hard. And, and uh, let you know how much we all appreciate it all the time. And we're not through, but we have a very good feeling that it will work well. And thank you, and Steve Simon. And again, you know that I'd like to know when we can begin work on John Jay Gardens, which we now have waited six years. Six years are over. And when do you think we can schedule our meeting on that? <coughs> um, I want to give you a proper answer. So I know you were uh, giving me a call today. And um, let me call you tomorrow. And I'll have okay. Support. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Select bus service. Anyone here like the select bus service in the off-board payment? 
We love select bus service on the east side. Uh, we're hoping that we can begin to see what it might look like and if it's appropriate for 79th Street because that keeps winning the Pokey Award. Uh, and then because we're, we, we want as many select buses and as many buses as we can on the east side, we hope to roll it out as far as possible. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up uh, Marcus Book to give a brief presentation and then answer some of your questions. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you, Councilman, and thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, I think it's going to be a tough act to follow uh, the Commissioner, Commissioner Castro, and alias uh, Karnak the Great. <laughs> I'd like you to be gentle with me, but I'm here tonight. I don't have a presentation, a visual presentation, but I will talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the bus service on the, uh, in the district where the Councilman serves. And to just begin, I just want to state, you know, because most people's experience on the bus is that they go out to wait for a bus, they look at the guide ride, and they determine that the bus is due in X number of minutes, and the bus comes, or sometimes the bus doesn't come, according to the, to the guide ride. But there are reasons for that. First, let me explain how we schedule our buses. You know, many people ask for more bus service on this line or that line. The way we schedule bus service is that we schedule it according to MTA guidelines, which are consistent throughout the city of New York, five boroughs. And this makes sure that everyone is getting consistent bus service throughout, and not just one borough or the other borough. And we do that based on ridership. That's why the councilman made the, the comment about you know using getting on the bus and increasing ridership, because if the ridership is low, we have to take those resources and use them where they're, where they're more needed. Okay, so we increase ridership, we increase bus service when there's more ridership, and we decrease ridership where there's less ridership. Um, a lot of the buses in your district, are, um, or the district community board A, you know, the M15, SBS M15, M31, M66, M72, M79, M86, SBS, M96, and I'm sure each one of you has your own particular uh, comments, quirks, or uh, problems with one of those routes. But what I want to tell you about those routes is that, and, and you'll scoff, and I hope you don't, um, is that most of those buses, with the exception of the M15, um, both SBS and local, are performing above the Manhattan average for what we call weight assessment. Weight assessment is essentially um, how long you wait for a bus in between. You pull up to a bus stop, you just missed the bus, how long does it take for the next bus to come? Okay, so that's weight assessment. We'd love to do it by, by more time percentage, but the reality in New York City is we schedule enough bus service to meet the demand on a particular route. And when those buses leave the depot in the morning or in the afternoon, they're on time, on schedule, and once they begin to interact with New York City and all the construction, double park vehicles, deliveries, um, by the time it gets to the end of the route, it's no longer really on schedule. So we strive really hard to maintain a consistent headway in time, the time between the buses. So the M15, and the M15 SBS are the only two buses that are performing below the Manhattan average. And the Manhattan average is about, uh, in weight assessment, is about uh, 73, 73%. Um, the, I'll just give you an example. I'll go down, down the list just really quickly. The M31, how many M31 riders are there out there? Yes. Okay, so there's plenty of M31 riders. In June of this year, the M31 was operating at 78.1% the weight assessment against the Manhattan average of 73%. And the July was even better, 79%, 79.7%. The M66 is even better. In June, it was operating at 80% uh, weight assessment, and in July, 82%. The M72, 84% in June, and in July, 87%, and 79, 82% in June, and 87% in July. The, uh, 
with the advent of the SBS on the 86, the uh, weight assessment on that route shot up significantly because of the, you know, we reduced the dwell time, the buses operate smoothly at 140. Fair flash, which makes a, a, lot of, me, a lot of the time spent at a bus stop is people just getting, lining up and waiting to swipe their cards. Get my cards, they don't have a card, where's my card? So that, the M86 is at 90% weight assessment in June and 92% in, uh, in July. M96 is just about at the Manhattan average. It's operating, or it operated in June at 74% and uh, improved significantly um, in July and went up to 87 percent. And I believe the, uh, the UN General Assembly is coming, or I don't know if it's begun already. <coughs> Things like that definitely affect the bus service in Manhattan. And it will affect your ride. So just keep that in mind in the coming days and <laughs> four weeks when you wait for a bus. Um, these things do happen, and we do our best to try to maintain the frequency that uh, meets the demand that's out there. Um, I'm going to go through the comment cards in a few minutes, but I just wanted to, um, and it's unfortunate that I don't have the, uh, the M15, but I want to give you, um, I just want to give you an example. We often get the, the complaint that there are not enough locals on a particular route uh, versus limited service, and I have to tell you that because of the dynamics of New York City traffic, the avenues, Madison Avenue, Fifth Avenue, First Avenue, Second Avenue, that it creates the perception that there is uh, so much more limited service than there is local service. And I don't have numbers for the 15, but I do have numbers for another frequent uh, corridor that gets a great deal of complaints about this issue, and that's the uh, Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue corridors. Um, for example, on the M1, M2, M3, and M4 buses that operate along those uh, corridors, we have between the hours of uh, like 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. 15 local buses scheduled uh, and 14 limited buses scheduled. In the midday period from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., there are 19 local buses scheduled and four limited buses scheduled. Um, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., 24 local buses, six limited buses. Now, of course, that's also the same one that's going. I just gave you southbound. That's coming down, coming down fifth. And Madison is very similar. Oh, we can skip. Okay, all right. That's and because those are oh, not in this district. Okay. So, um, <coughs> so a lot of excuse me, a lot of the stuff that I have relates to these bus routes that I've just been talking about. So I'm going to begin to read some of. Your questions, because they all pertain to what I'm speaking about. Let me just, uh, we, we got them more, so if you have bus questions, please hold your hand up, and somebody from my office will come and pick them up. Uh, the, 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 we, we have several, 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 let me just grab yours to pull some of them out. Uh, give me one moment. So we have uh, about, We have about six cards from the audience, uh, just so you know, we, uh, I think I see Liz Patrick from the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association. How many of you folks are live uh, in the vicinity of East 72nd Street? So uh, the, all, a lot of these folks, about 2,400 people so far, have signed the petition on our website. Uh, for those of you who asked where we are, so it's 2,400 signatures. This is one of the largest petitions we've seen. This is even more than opposed the uh, tower at 58th Street. and. Uh, Next week, East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association will be out in force asking for uh, more locations. What we intend to do, not tonight, but at a future event, as we hope to take all of your signatures and deliver them to MTA and ask for them to restore uh, that service at 72nd Street. This is something that uh, the State Senator the Scrooger also supports. And so uh, I don't think MTA has a, a, an answer on that tonight, but uh, we will definitely pass that along. And then I think there were the rest of the questions, which we will. Go through. There's more. Okay. What we're going to try to do is I'm going to try to group them for uh, uh, Mr. Book as he goes. Okay. 
Uh, the first, uh, <laughs> uh, the first uh, question was MTA keeping food and beverages off transit buses for cleaner service. Specifically, on uh, M66 was one of the buses, as well as uh, I think that was one of the buses. Sorry, go on. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the MTA and uh, New York City Transit has both signage on many of our buses telling people that uh, food and beverages are not allowed on the bus. We also have onboard announcements that will occasionally make that announcement. Unfortunately, the bus driver is not authorized to confront a passenger about food and beverages on a bus. We, we just have to, um, we have to be mindful. Mean, the, the, the riding public has to be mindful. The only thing I can really say about that is they're not supposed to be on the bus. And we make an effort to try to remind people that uh, the bus is for riding and not for, uh, for meal time. Okay. Uh, this question regards when will bus stops be restored on 2nd Avenue? Um, and 91st Street, also, when will, will trees be planted on 2nd Avenue? And that one is for MTACC. So I can't really answer the second part two of that question. But I will say that the bus stops that were previously in place prior to the construction of the 2nd Avenue subway will be restored to their four locations at the completion of the 2nd Avenue subway work which right now is, to all knowledge that I have, is on schedule to be completed by December of this year. So these are all M66 questions. Uh, M66, can you uh, provide more buses for the M66 after Lincoln Center performances and time them to uh, when uh, the performance are coming, often later buses fill up and skip stops at Amsterdam and Central Park West. Uh, in the other direction, hospital employees are filling the buses at uh, York and First Avenue so that the buses are full and don't stop on Second Avenue when they're going west. And uh, somebody has a specific question on the M66, but uh, my vision is not what it used to be, so if you uh, touch base with somebody outside and we will take your question and pass it on to MTA. Well, in answer to the question, can we just add more service? Um, again, I have to just repeat how we add service to our buses, and that's based on ridership. Now, there, there are two instances which I will take those two cards back to the office where we may need to have our planning division go out and do a specific check at these locations where, for instance, the hospitals where the buses may early one of the route get filled up and there not be enough seats. But we can't just arbitrarily provide more service to a route. We do it based on MTA guidelines. But I will have our planning division go out and look at the specific locations that you pointed out. They don't stop. Now, a bus not stop. No, no, excuse me, four or five buses go by, totally filled up. Oh, so, uh, best thing to do, raise your hand, we'll give you a card if the point hasn't been fully addressed. Want to avoid the crosstalk, we've been amazing so far. Uh, so I think just the point being, and I think that the underline from one of the cards was just, the buses get full, and once they're full, they stop. They don't stop with, for anyone else. So I will have someone take a look at that specific. Okay, so this goes to what I was trying to give you an example of, which uh, with routes that are unfortunately not in the councilman's district, is that we actually do schedule um, local and limited service to meet the demand out there. Second Avenue is a is a hard case right now with the Second Avenue subway work going on, um, and when that is cleared up, I think you'll see a marked improvement in the way those buses are staggered and how they come. Um, I don't have the numbers right now for the 15, 
but I can share them with, uh, with the councilman just for your knowledge. But I am positive that the right number of buses are being scheduled for, um, for the 15 in the uh, SPS. Now remember, too, that the way these buses are scheduled based on ridership, if there's a market increase in ridership for SBS customers, obviously that's going to get uh, uh, a little bit more service. And if the ridership is rather low on the locals, as a result, that is adjusted as well. If you schedule buses to meet demand by amount of readership, what is done to account for riders that give up waiting because of waiting too long? For example, wait for a team local uh, so long, I might go to express stop, but really over not enough locals, not that ridership is low on the uh, locals. Uh, what about bunches, uh, bunching of buses? Two nights uh, past, I... Uh, Walked more than 20 blocks up First Avenue before four select bu uh, buses bunched past me. No regular M15 either. Uh, are there no longer starters to fix this? Uh, uh, local bus service on the M15, horrific half hour wait. Four to five express buses uh, to one to none of local in 20 minutes wait time. Need more local buses uh, and just to. to, to uh, uh, why are there so many out-of-service buses on 2nd Avenue? And just to, to share, uh, every morning when I walk from 81st in New York to my district office, I always go to the M15 in hopes I can catch that to work, and I always get to work at 93rd yeah. Street 20 minutes later before the buses show up. Okay, um, the old uh, chicken and egg question regarding um, what if people give up on, on using the service. I can't really speak to because that's something that I, I cannot, or our planners cannot see. What I will tell you is that the, chip, the, the numbers would have to be substantial for us to, for it to affect the schedule, for people to just amass, give up on using a bus at a particular location. Um, and what we can control is what we can check and what we can document. So that's what that is. Uh, there, there have been follow-up questions that have been passed up. I, questions because they're, they're going to to I will slow it down a little bit. Uh, how do they measure ridership when they don't stop? And what is the actual need for dispatches? use of dispatches. Dispatchers, okay, how does bus bunching occur? Bus bunching occurs very simply. When buses are coming down an, an avenue, second avenue, or fifth or Madison or whatever, um, when, a, when they reach a pinch point, when I say a pinch point, that means potentially a double parked truck, um, uh, heavy traffic, they begin to back up one after the other and get behind each other. And then once that pinch point opens, they all come down together. So it's it's really it's really a function of uh, it's not a function of scheduling. It's a function of this the realities of uh, operating the vehicle in New York City. Yes. Um, regarding the question about uh, not in service buses, this one I think I have a little good news for you. Just give me a second. Okay. In, our, in our current capital program, that's the 2018-2019, no, pardon me, 2015 capital program, we will be getting about 2,000 uh, new buses. These will replace a lot of the old buses that we have some of which the oldest buses in Manhattan are on the uh, unfortunately on the M15 map. So when the new buses come in, and I mean when, when you have old buses, what you have is more service calls for buses. If they break down, they have to be taken out, they have to be taken out of service. That'll be a bus that is pulled out of pulled out of the rotation. 
Um, what dispatchers do is when things like that occur, they adjust the service to continue to provide that regular interval of service. So what you have sometimes is you have that out of service bus coming and say no passengers or not in service because that bus is being asked to short term come around and get back into the location so it can make sure that there are enough buses to provide service for the people who are waiting. So dispatchers play a critical role now with uh, new technology. Bus dispatchers are now equipped with, we have our real time um, bus time uh, um, application, which allows us to see where all our buses are in the, in the system, in one place, and dispatchers now have tablets where they can just move buses around with a lot more ease and a lot more efficiency. So dispatchers are really, really critical and important. Just all your file. There you go. These two are grouped together for you. This question is about M79 service on weekends. Uh, incidentally, uh, a point of interesting trivia, the E79 Street Neighbor Association started to get uh, weekend service for Sundays on the M31. 30 and years ago. Thir 30 years ago. And so uh, part of uh, the reason you can come out to these events is because we can organize together to get Sunday service on the M31, hopefully things like that. That wasn't 70. my question, so maybe whoever, your, we have your question. No, but maybe whoever asked that question wants to elaborate on it. I don't know. So, so, so it's multiple folks have asked for M79 weekend okay. improvement, and uh, just giving uh, Marcus a moment to look it up. Okay, just to understand what we deal with on the M79, um, um, what I can say about the 79 is that it was last changed on the weekends in uh, July of 2015, and there were really small reductions in service on the 79 on the weekends, and it's simply a function of not a lot of ridership on the 79 during the weekends. So um, if the ridership increases, we'll keep an eye on it. And if it's appropriate to provide, you know, to allocate those resources to the 79 on the weekends, we absolutely will. May, may I comment for one second? If I uh, Betty, if you can let us get through okay. all the questions, uh, and we will get to your M31 question. No, no, I wanted to comment on this last question, but I'll wait. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are uh, two questions on uh, the 66 is follow-up, that there's two QM66 service after 7 p.m., and uh, that there apparently used to be a dispatcher, you can fact check us on this one, at Lincoln Center, and they would send new buses as they filled up after the shows, and that 20 to 25 minutes is just too long to wait. So the last time the schedule for the 66 was adjusted was, and it went into effect in June uh, 2015. The data that was collected to, to make that schedule change actually increased PM peak M66 service from four minutes to, it's a very small increase of 3.5 minutes. So, I, I think that there is an understanding that there are a lot of there's a lot of service in the PM people on the on the 66, and it's being adjusted adjusted accordingly. But this is post peak is the question. Ten o'clock not at night. Right. Well, it, it would clearly it depend. Is, it would, after they said that there are four buses total on the M66. Two few people get left behind at the bus stop after performance. The bus fills completely. So I, 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 so I think we've made our points on the M66, on the M79, and on the school buses. Uh, so uh, one question, this is a tech question, uh, 
With the MTA bus time app, we can see for how long buses idle at terminals before departing. By the time it reaches 79th Street, the driver is declining passengers because it's full. Is there something we're aware of uh, working to, that you're working to improve in terms of uh, that piece? So it's just continuing on that theme, but uh, I guess the question is, uh, why are the buses idling at the terminal before they depart? Why aren't they just picking more people up? First of all, buses should not be idling. Bus should not be on um, to be turned off. Second, uh, bus drivers, these are, these are union employees. They are allowed to take a break at the end of the route, whether it be to comfort break or lunch. So whatever time that bus driver is spending, it's part of the schedule. He has a built-in um, layover time at the location. Now, as far as the bus coming full, that again is something that we probably need to send the planning personnel to take a look and see what what the condition is and what can be done to, to alleviate that. Uh, and, and just to, to put a little bit of perspective in terms of the idling, or there shouldn't be idling, but the layover time when you're watching on the bus time and they're sitting there for a little bit, uh, they don't get, there's no bathrooms on the buses, so that's their chance to take a bathroom break. So uh, if the route is a two hour route, or a four hour route, or a half hour route, that's their chance to stop. And, and go to the bathroom. It's a chance for them to stop, get lunch. If there's plans to just stop and focus, uh, there, there is no smoking on the bus. Uh, well, a person indicated that there are buses. They've observed drivers texting and drivers with radios. They have photos. Are they allowed to do either? They are not allowed to do either. If, in fact, you see anything that you believe fairly is an infraction, of rules and regulations and unsafe. Just have someone, you can either call the councilman's office, but it is critical that you have the date, time, the location, and the bus number. Okay, because this way we can track that guy or the lady um, and have supervision deal with her and the people that night. Okay, so no, they're not supposed to be. Students from Wagner don't bother to pay in the afternoon. <laughs> That's what the card says. They should be paid. Um, and uh, again, an enforcement of things like that, unfortunately, is not in the hands of the driver. That would have to be done by either an undercover police officer or a New York City Police Department. Uh, more bus service on the M39, 31. I got to the M31 at 79th in York, and a woman in a wheelchair had been waiting since 7:30. Uh, so just more requests for service from our uh, buses. Uh, and this one, I'll just read and uh, uh, ask that you come and share your name and information. Uh, to degree traffic, trucks might deliver at night. Why should uh, cars park on city streets? Car owners should car park in garages. This would allow smoother traffic. So in terms of the uh, trucks at night, that's something that say, Senator Liv Kruger and I have been uh, discussing with uh, uh, Betty Cooper Wallerstein as well as MTA. So if you're interested in that, please share your information with my office. We will pass that on to State Senator Liz Kruger, uh, who is at least uh, starting to learn about. And I think the, I have two questions. I have one more card, and then I will pass on Betty Cooper Wallerstein's questions. Uh, when will uh, bus stop be restored? This is MTA Capital Construction. So do we? Okay. Uh, Betty, have you I, I don't want to do my question. What I want to say is I wanted to congratulate you, and I want everybody here, and of course uh, Marcus has been there a long time, but I want everyone here to know that we had an hour and a half yesterday with the MTA going over every street and every avenue uh, in our district. And for the first time, and I've been doing this a long time, we usually have a half an hour for buses and a half an hour for capital discussion on the subways. We now have the head of the New York City Transit, who's a former bus driver, who was interested enough to give you and the other elected official one and a half hours to talk about every single bus line. So I really have a great deal of confidence that they're going to listen to us, but don't talk statistics because people are not going to be there if they wait like this person in a wheelchair. She couldn't take a cab. So to turn to, to stop to uh, 
say that when you have decreased ridership, you give decreased buses, that will only continue to be true. When you give more bus service, more people will feel like using it. And oh. never, ever would I ever think that you wouldn't notify our council member so he could notify all of us that you actually took away service from the 79th Crosstown a month or two ago when we were always asking for more. So that's something we want to look forward to working on. Uh, thank you to Betty Cooper Wallerstein and thank you to Marcus Book. He came late. He uh, knew that he was going to be the most popular speaker. Uh, we have, uh, so if we could just thank him and you do not have to wait until tonight. So we have one more in-person presentation. Uh, this is from Abby. She's a last minute edition. Uh, anyone here live in the 90s on the Upper East Side? So a couple of you. Uh, we have a fresh food box. It's on Thursdays. It's $12. You buy it the week before. And uh, oh my god, the amount of groceries you get farm fresh. You will never taste fr fruit and vegetables like this before or after. Uh, my my in-laws are driving in from Brooklyn just to get a piece of my share because everything is just so far fresh and delicious. So Abby's just going to come and uh, speak a little bit about our fresh food box. And uh, while she's coming, I'm just going to pull the audience. So I do have uh, the MTA Capital Construction weren't able to come because of a family emergency. Uh, if you would like me to just go through their presentation, which we'll be putting up on the internet later, I'm willing to click through it and do my best. Uh, so how many people would like to skip that and just go home? Who here would like me to click through it? Okay, so those of you who want to go home, you're welcome to leave after Abby or even whenever. Please make sure to complete the surveys. Please make sure to tell your friends and loved ones about this and how they can get involved. And I'd like to just uh, turn it over to uh, Abby, who can share some. But this is just a picture of what some of the produce looks like. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you to Councilmember Gillis for inviting me to speak. Um, I just want to give a quick overview of what the food box is and how you could use, utilize it if you'd like to have more vegetables in your life. Um, Basically, the food box is a food bank program. It's $12 a week, and anyone can sign up. Uh, you sign up one week ahead of time, and then you come and re return to the site to uh, see a bag full of fresh local produce waiting for you. Um, the program has kind of a two-part mission. So it's from Grow My Seed. And what we're really trying to do is bring all of the produce grown upstate to the people down in the city where we really need it, you know? Uh, so it's a really good deal. You're buying fresh local produce for wholesale prices. And it's really fun for people who want to get a little bit more inventive, be pushed out of their comfort zone with cooking, uh, for trying to lose weight, who are facing health difficulties, um, for people who just want to live, live a little bit healthier uh, at an affordable price. Um, so if anyone would like to talk to me a little bit more in depth about it afterwards, I'm happy to answer questions. I have plenty of flyers with our uh, day and time. Um, please do so, and I can take some questions now if anyone is interested. The flyers are going to be right in the back at the tables. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I, I buy a share this week for next week? <laughs> you cannot buy a share this week for next week. Uh, the number is already in. It's kind of a long communication trail between when you guys okay. sign up. Yeah. So it's 3.30 to 6.30? 3.30 till 6.30 every, sat every Thursday. Uh, right in front of the council member's office on 93rd and 2nd Avenue. There's actually also a site on Tuesday evenings from 3.30 till 6.30 uh, at the Lenox Hill Neighborhood House on 1st Avenue and 70th Street, which is a little closer. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's my Okay. Mm -hmm. So we can pay the Thursday before at Ben Callis' office, and we have to do that between 3.30 and 6, so we can come anytime and pay on Thursday. 
Yep, exactly. You can come at any time between 3.30 and 6.30. I'll be there, and at that time you get to see in person what the produce looks like, and uh, I'll explain everything. And actually, we're doing a promotion right now that includes a free cookbook with signing up, which is a nice little bonus. If, if I don't want to do it one week, can I, can I skip a week? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's cool about this program is that you can come in and out whenever is convenient for you. So you're going on vacation, you don't need it for the next week, that's fine. Come back whenever you like and uh, whenever is convenient for you. Richard Mulieri, Senior Director of Public Affairs, had a family emergency, uh, but I'll do my best to uh, step in. If you'd like to step out, please feel free to do so. Uh, so uh, the, 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 if the drum roll can start. Uh, when will the second half of Subway be done? And so we're still on target, on track for December 2016. So as of September 1st, we are at 97.25% complete. Uh, this is going to be Q service, which means we will be directly connected from the East River to uh, Coney Island and the beach. And uh, actually, it's, it's very helpful for me in particular, and uh, that's why I supported this, because it will connect me with my in-laws. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, Subway, I mean, I kid a little bit, uh, but they're very excited. It's going to be a single-site trip. Uh, these are the ancillary facilities that are going in all over uh, the district. Uh, and uh, one person had asked me, well, why aren't we putting retail here? And it's actually because we went to the board and a number of locations of the board, the community board, they felt that they preferred not to have uh, retail there. So this is 96th Street. This is 72nd Street, northeast of 69th Street. Uh, and so uh, those have tremendous value, which I think I will hit on soon. Uh, this is what the entrances will look like. This is 96th Street and 3rd. Seeing as believing, and uh, since they're putting in all this above the ground infrastructure, it would be a shame not to have things happening underground. So this is the elevator at 96th Street. Uh, this is the 96th Street entrance, and that is some of the beautiful tile work that you can already see. Uh, this is the 72nd Street entrance on the northwest corner. Uh, and uh, this is the streetscape. We're getting new tree guards. Those are already coming in. And you can see where the tree pits are going, and uh, that is thanks to uh, Community Board 8. Rita Popper and myself, we've been advocating and making sure that these would go in. If you see any of these places going in without a tree guard, let me know. Uh, our goal is to get every single one of these tree beds adopted. If you're in a building that has this in front, please contact my office so we can get that. One of the reasons we need the tree guards is because we have a lot of uh, dogs on the Upper East Side. <laughs> and dogs and tree beds don't get along, and if you want to add plantings to it, uh, the guardrails are a necessity. Uh, there was a city light. This has been requested by the CB8 uh, Community Board 8. Uh, to the extent you are having any trouble with the light being too bright, shining into your apartment, keeping you up, or things like that, or it is not bright enough, please do contact our office so that we can work with you on these new lights. Uh, they are LED lights. This is what the restored sidewalks are looking like. Uh, please, 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 as the sidewalks are getting put back in, if they are not up to par, if they are not even if there's anything wrong with them, please tell me now so that I can refer to MTA Capital Construction and we can get it fixed immediately. Uh, this is the aerial view from 86th Street, and as you can see, the clock house is far, far, far uh, distant memory, and we are looking forward to getting that street back. This is the striping on 2nd Avenue that's going in. Uh, the uh, bus lanes will be bus lanes during the uh, day and will be uh, available for vehicles in the evening. Uh, this is our uh, newly repaved 2nd Avenue, and it's started to get normal once again. Uh, this is 86th Street uh, Station, the newly renovated sidewalks. And if I'm going too fast, just raise your hand. This is the 63rd Street uh, Station, and the newly restored public plaza there. Uh, underground, this is what the station is going to look like at 96th Street. This is uh, giving me a little bit of faith uh, that uh, it might actually be Done. And by October, they're hoping to run things. This is our stairwell at 86th Street. Uh, this, this is actually my first time seeing this. Is this anyone else's first time? Yeah. So this is great. We're going to have this online afterwards. Uh, but this is the 86th Street Station stairwell. These are the escalators. The best part about escalators is when they break their stairs. Uh, 
uh, but that being said, in terms of the, six, the escalators, whether it's here or at the F train or the F train over at Savelle Island, please let us know when it's happening. We can work with FTA to make sure we get the escalators taken care of. Here's what our turnstiles look like. Uh, here's the uh, crossover at 72nd Street Station. Uh, this is the 63rd Station elevators. Uh, and uh, the interesting uh, tidbit here is that the F train and the 2nd Avenue line will meet. The uh, tunnels are already pre-dug. They were just waiting for a train to come in. Uh, this, so that was phase one. Phase one is December 1st. Uh, phase two, had anyone heard that there was a, a, a hiccup in funding on phase two? So uh, folks got very nervous. They thought we were gonna get our station, our, our part done. Phase two is from 96th Street and up. So on phase two, uh, we were able to get additional funding and then it's gonna go to 106, 116th, and uh, 125th. Uh, so this is what we're looking at. Uh, the green space, and I've been dying to use this uh, laser or lightsaber, I don't know what it is. So uh, the green portions are existing tunnels. So this is the portion that was dug 100 years ago, uh, that, or, or in various stages as they did it in fits and starts. So that green area is the existing tunnel the uh, orange area is where they're going to experience the most uh, uh, disturbance because it's going to be the cut and cover, which is what we saw at around 86th Street and others, where they literally just dug a hole into the ground. And uh, then in this uh, blue area here, uh, between 116th and 125th, we're looking at a new tunnel, uh, which is going to be soft ground, a tunnel boring machine. And uh, then uh, over here, they're also going to use uh, soft ground tunnels, and uh, this over here is actually our, our bedrock. So that is a uh, phase two, which we fought with, uh, uh, fought, working with Assemblymember Robert Rodriguez and uh, Assemblymember Keith Wright, and all of this is coalition from Carl, Carol Maloney on to uh, Charlie Rangel. We were able to make this happen. These are the contact informations for our folks at Sub Second Avenue Subway. Uh, construction, and uh, that is the end of the show. So, uh, I just want to uh, ask two items that didn't come up. Uh, the reason that we have these uh, buildings everywhere is uh, they're going to be handling the air. So, when you're there, it's not going to be air conditioned, as I understand, it's air tempered. Uh, which I'm not sure the difference between that vocabulary, they're not here to answer, but it should not be a sauna. Uh, the other piece is that uh, this is accessible. So if you are disabled, if you are with a wheelchair, you'll actually be able to get somewhere in the city on accessible, uh, on accessible line. That is not something we currently have on the 456. The 456 currently carries one third of every single subway rider in the city. 86th Street has 20.7 million riders a year. That puts us, uh, the next station up from that would be Penn Station at 8th Avenue. The next station up would be Penn Station at 7th. So we have the highest ridership, and this is part of why we are getting the service. So um, again, uh, first Friday of every month, please join me in my office. Uh, second Tuesday of every month is policy night. We have legal clinics. Uh, for housing, for family law, for domestic violence, for family planning, for life planning. Uh, if you need a lawyer, please feel free to contact our office. And uh, I, you don't need to come to me. If you have your co-op or condo board meeting or your annual meeting, I'll show up at your house. If you have, uh, if you can gather 10 neighbors together, I do bend in your building. I, I work for you, and there's 168,000 of you that I work for. My goal is to meet each and every one of you. And uh, uh, hopefully I, I can, and uh, I hope we can work together. I want to thank all of you for coming out. Please make sure to get your reusable bag. Uh, if you know anyone who likes your reusable bag, uh, please let them know they can just come by our office any day. Let them know they live in our district, and uh, they can uh, get one. I want to thank all of our community leaders. If you live uh, around 72nd Street, please make sure to see Liz Patrick and let her know you'd like to join the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association. Uh, what day is your meeting? Uh, well, September 27th. September 27th at uh, 7 o'clock. 7 p.m. Uh, church of the Epiphany. York at the Church of the York. Epiphany. And if you live above 72nd Street, as uh, far north as uh, 
the 80s. 96. As far north as 96, there's the East 79th Street Neighborhood Association. Your next meeting is? September 22nd. September 22nd. At the uh, Upper East Side Rehab Center, 211 East 79th. At Upper East Side Rehab Center, 211 East 79. 79. Oh, Second I know which third. one you're talking yeah. about. Sorry, it's at uh, DeWitt. It's at the DeWitt Nursing, the old DeWitt Nursing Center. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for filling out the cards. If you feel your question wasn't answered, please make sure that in addition to getting your bag, we take your information and pass your question on to the agency. You do not need to wait to our office. town halls. And uh, thank you and have a great evening.